Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Susan Hudson from Texas Fertility Center with another episode of Fertility Docs Uncensored. And I have my amazing, beautiful, insightful co-host, Dr. Carrie Vedient from Fertility Center of Las Vegas. Hi. <laughs> and Dr. Abby Evelyn from Nashville Fertility Center. <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> How are y'all doing today? Awkward. Good, good. It's early in the morning and I am wired already. <laughs> <laughs> You've drank your two cups of coffee this morning already, Carrie? I didn't. I don't do coffee. You don't? I didn't know that. No. Well, I, I, you do any caffeine? Very rarely. I mean, can you, frankly, can you imagine me on caffeine? No. You're a little scary. I would imagine a little scary on caffeine. Um, oh I'm gosh. wired. I mean, it's a balance when you're talking about additional substances, the body like caffeine, I just shoot through the roof and... Alcohol, it's it, two drinks is all you it shoot takes. through the floor. <laughs> I, well, no, at this point, like you give me really, it's like one heavy pour of whatever, and the yeah. filter totally goes. And so, um, there's not I much culture cautious. there to begin with. <laughs> you would be amazed at what I don't say. Um, I, I just did a Instagram recording because I've started to do like fertility factoids every day. Yeah, I think I've seen those. Impressive. The one, the one that I did yesterday was um, I started singing on it and I'm like, I don't know if this is good or bad. Cause I was talking about sex and I'm doing the, the, now I can't remember it. What, what, some random song that if I sang it, you would know exactly what it is. Um, um, too sexy and, for my whatever. No, it's the other one. <laughs> Let's talk about sex. That one. Let's talk about sex, baby. Yes. 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 That one. And so, I mean, can you imagine if I added caffeine to all of that? So my, my big, my, the first thing that came to my mind is how many likes did you get on that one? I picked up a hundred followers. Wow. Pretty good. So you yeah. need to talk about sex more often, Gary. Yeah. Well, the hashtags <laughs> I used were like hashtag sex, hashtag intercourse, hashtag like all those things. <laughs> so I'm. So, so maybe it weren't, it wasn't quite the. Maybe not quite your normal audience. Yeah. Not quite the normal audience. Yeah. I I would not be surprised if that drops relatively rapidly when they realize (laughs) that I'm a nerd, not, uh, not anything. Cold answer or something. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You know, hashtag sex is coming from Vegas. You gotta, you gotta think. Yeah, I know. That's a tease. All right. It is a tease. We'll see how that goes. (laughs) But anyway. (laughs) Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, this week, so that everybody knows what happened this last week, most importantly, it was my birthday. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I, I I texted Susan and wished her a very happy birthday. And then a few hours later, the big news that Queen Elizabeth passed away happened and it just, it broke my, I'm a, I'm a Royal watcher on On my birthday. I will forever. I mean, like my Royal watching day started when I was four years old, when my mom woke me up at 2 a.m. to watch Lady Di get married to married Prince Charles. To Prince I was Charles. 15, so I was I was a little older back then. I'd come in from yeah. a, day, a late date that night and got up early to go watch Lady Di get married to yeah. Prince Charles. Like that's one of my youngest memories. Mm-hmm. And I mean, yep. when Catherine and William got married, like my family came over and we had an all night thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I was. I was on my honeymoon when Kate and William got married and remember watching, I remember standing there because I was so sunburned, standing there watching the TV because I couldn't sit down and I couldn't lie against anything. Just watching all of the pageantry and her gorgeous dress and all of the things. Yeah. So I was, was, you know, I was so sad about Queen Elizabeth, but she lived an amazing life. Oh my goodness. I mean, just, just thinking of everything she's seen, it, it, yeah. it's just, it really is inconceivable. <laughs> yeah. I heard some story of where the, the prime minister of India came to visit her a few years ago and she pulled out this handkerchief that Gandhi gave her for the occasion of her wedding and showed it to him. You know, it's like, she's like a, a walking history. I mean, living museum oh. until the other day, basically she had all these important things that she had done and been a part of. It's crazy and I think she journaled the entire time I think it would just oh wow amazing to you know it it was funny I I I saw a posting on Facebook of when she came to San Antonio Texas 
and rode on the river downtown San Antonio in oh, one of those really? little touristy river wow. boats. I mean, oh, obviously wow. it had like Queen Elizabeth II on it and stuff like that. But I, I shared it on my Facebook page and I was just like, that's pretty cool. Like it, it, you know, you don't think of like the queen doing something that like regular tourists do. And it, yeah. it, was, it was neat. So when you said San Antonio in Rode On, I thought the next two words were going to be mechanical bull. <laughs> <laughs> that like, would have been, that would have been a sight. I didn't think that a queen Elizabeth would ever do something like that, but the riverboat makes a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I had, to, um, I had to think though, how would Liz Trust feel that the last official visit, the the last photograph of her alive on an official visit was when she touched Liz Trust's hand? You know, it's like you almost wonder if there's gonna be some conspiracy theory or something there that Liz passed or something, or <laughs> that would be a bad way to be remembered, I think. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's go on to our question. Our question is actually going to go into our topic today. So I think we'll, we'll read the question. We're going to answer it as, as we go. Um, we're going to talk about recurrent pregnancy loss today. So our question is, hi docs. I've had two recurrent pregnancy losses, one last year and one more recently. My OB doesn't seem to think I need a referral to a fertility specialist. He recommends keep trying and that having previous miscarriages does not increase your chance for a next, for the next one. In my personal opinion, I feel like I'm being set up for failure. If I were to try again without the workup or evaluation, what are your thoughts? Is that not the best question to lead into the subject? Yeah. Absolutely. I cannot think of a better setup. We didn't plant this, right? I didn't like literally <laughs> it was the question I was like, Ooh, Carrie, Carrie, we never plant questions, right? <laughs> no, no. We really at don't. this point, we don't. At this point, we don't need to because we have so many to uh, answer, answer at a certain yeah. time. But there's always something relevant to what we want to talk about. Absolutely. All right. So let's let's start off with the definition of what recurrent pregnancy loss is in 2022 because it's changed over some of our careers. So. Go for it, Abby. So basically, we used to say three or more losses. Now we say two or more losses. Now, the American College of OBGYN defines it as babies that are viable pregnancies, not biochemical pregnancies. But I think we kind of have talked about this before that, you know, when I see a patient that's had two losses, I generally think it's reasonable to do a workup, whether they're biochemicals or whether they're you know, babies with heartbeats that have been lost. The um, ASRM definition no longer says that it has to be a clinical pregnancy. It is just, it is a, if you have a positive pregnancy test and it fails, that is a pregnancy loss that counts. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the reason why that distinction has changed over the years is um, people are, people are paying a lot more attention to it, but one of the things to think about the difference between a biochemical pregnancy and a, what's commonly termed as a miscarriage is that a biochemical pregnancy is picked up by lab testing. You get the HCG, either the qualitative or quantitative. So yes or no versus numbers. And if it's only gotten to that point, that's considered a biochemical. If it has progressed beyond that to the point where you can pick it up on an ultrasound, it's considered a miscarriage. Um, and so as tests have gotten more and more sensitive, you know, now you can get those pregnancy tests that pick up pregnancy before you've ever missed your period. And that's, it's important to understand some of the distinction because there is a, an incredibly large percentage of pregnancies that are lost before they hit a clinical point where the woman would even know. So if she wasn't trying and she was just paying attention to, oh, did I get my period? Um, it used to be that that's what it took to know that you were pregnant or not. Now we can pick it up even before then. And there's really quite a large amount of attrition that happens between the, the point where you can conceive and the point when you, when you would miss a period. And it's, it's just because those losses get recognized so very early in the body that the body says, uh, uh, we can't do this. This isn't going to, this isn't going to work. So we're not even going to get started. Let's go over some basic miscarriage terminology. Okay. I'm going to start with my least favorite blighted ovum. Like seriously, that's the worst name <laughs> on the planet. Doesn't sound good. Well, yeah. so I did wrong. <laughs> I don't know, but it is when somebody says they've had a blighted ovum, you know what they mean. And what that really means is that there's a sac in the uterus, but 
essentially we can't see a baby there. Either the baby didn't form or it's so tiny when the pregnancy stopped that we, we can't see anything there. And so it, it doesn't really tell us anything more though, than if you said somebody had a, you know, a right. miscarriage but or a pregnancy. The thing is, is an ovum is an egg. Okay. The thing is, is if you see something in the uterus, egg and sperm came together. It's not that's like good, the, it's not like the, thought about that. That's it's true. It's a yeah. terrible term. Blighted it's a ovum. Terrible, I, blighted ovum. It means it's your not egg ovum. did not do something correctly. Mm, no, it means <laughs> the embryo did not do something correctly. Something correctly. It may have been right. due to something the egg did initially, but blighted ovum to me is a terrible term. So my least favorite term in all of this, and it's mostly from the grief that it has given patients and subsequently given me is spontaneous abortion. So mm -hmm. this is the medical term. Like if your doctor is coding a miscarriage, they're going to code for a spontaneous abortion. And I've had patients come back to me absolutely livid because they see in their chart, the word abortion. And they think that we are saying that they did an intentional abortion. And that is not at all the case. A spontaneous abortion means that the pregnancy mm -hmm. stopped growing on its own. The lay term for that is miscarriage. And so um, that's something that we use because there is there's a huge amount of difference between a spontaneous abortion and a you know, voluntary interruption of pregnancy, uh, therapeutic abortion, whatever, whatever the other terms are. So a spontaneous abortion, when I see that, or SAB, means, okay, this, this stopped on its own accord. And patients can get very upset about that when really it's the medical term and that's all it is describing it. Another term that people can get upset about, and in this case, it doesn't necessarily mean a miscarriage is going to happen, but threatened miscarriage. So that's a that's a code that we use if, if somebody's pregnant and they come in and they're having bleeding. And most of the time when people come in and they're having bleeding, most of the time things turn out fine. I mean, it's really less common that they do go on to actually have a miscarriage, but that's the code we have to use because it tells the insurer, you know, why we may have you come back again for another ultrasound to look again. But most of the time in those situations, um, the pregnancy turns out to be okay, actually. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between a missed abortion versus an incomplete abortion? So a missed abortion is when um, somebody comes in and, you know, we, uh, we know she's pregnant, she knows she's pregnant, um, even if she doesn't know she's pregnant, and they do the ultrasound and they expect to see a heartbeat, they expect to see progressive growth. And when they put the ultrasound on, they see that there's no heartbeat, but the woman has not had any cramping. She's not had any bleeding. She doesn't have any indication that she is in the process of miscarrying. So it's caught at a point before the woman carrying the pregnancy knows what's happening. And so that's why it's called a missed abortion. And, um, and it means that it's not caught until after it's already happened. And before there's an indication outwardly that something's going on. And an incomplete abortion is where someone has miscarried or lost part of the tissue, but there's still some remaining. And, and that can happen, you know, even if I actually had a patient recently who passed an intact sac and you could see the fetus, but she still had some retained tissue there that we had to go in and remove. So incomplete just means that you've miscarried some of the tissue, but not all of the tissue. And what's it called when we're all done with the miscarriage? completed abortion. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there's, there's also, um, an inevitable abortion where you've got, you go in and you check and the cervix is open and stuff is coming out and, you know, you, you may still see heartbeat. You may still see things that are, are going on, but because of the rest of the physiology, usually an open cervix, there's really not much you can do about it at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, it's coming, even though it may not have fully happened yet. Okay. Well, let's, let's start talking a little bit about what are some of the causes that people have miscarriage? So what, what's the number one reason that it, an embryo might not keep on to make a baby? Chromosomal issues. So at least 50% of the miscarriages that women have really regardless of age are due to a chromosomal abnormality. And that's just because when eggs in women um, are released or ovulated, the chromosomes, the two sets of chromosomes are together. They have to divide and come apart. And just about 50% of the time, it doesn't happen that, that well. And so even in young women, when a woman has a miscarriage, if we were to test the products of conception um, that we remove, 
about half the time it's due to a genetic abnormality, too few or too many chromosomes <clears throat> in that embryo. What, what are other sources of those chromosomal abnormalities though? So kind of the standard one is what we call non-disjunction. And so that means that when you have the chromosomes packaged up in the eggs, they need to separate so that 50% get chucked out in the trash, the other 50% go with the embryo, and then um, you have the, the chromosomes coming from the sperm. So most commonly, there's a random event called this non-disjunction, which means it doesn't separate when it should. Then you can also have other chromosomal problems called translocations. So this means that instead of having 50% of the chromosomes on either side with a single sweet little hinge that can be dislocated to separate them very cleanly, you have an imbalance so that instead of 50-50, it's 60-40, 75-25, whatever, whatever that non-50-50 number is. So that when they go to separate, when the hinge breaks free, you have too much on one side and too little on the other side. And the person, the parent is fine because they have a hundred percent total. But when you split it up, it means that they're passing on too much or too little to that embryo. And this can happen from the egg or from the sperm. And um, it means that the embryo has a much, much higher chance of having an inappropriate amount of the chromosomal material. And this is something that because it's passed along from the parent's genetics, this is not a random event. So when you see that split, you are more likely to see an inappropriate amount of chromosomal material that ultimately leads to a miscarriage. So how do we determine if there's a chromosomal problem with mom or dad? So when we're looking at a chromosomal problem with mom or dad, um, that is usually picked up by a karyotype. That's a big word. Yep. Abby, <laughs> go for so it. Just, just, we just draw blood basically. And, and we're able to tell from that blood, from the cells in the blood, what the karyotype, what the chromosomal abnormality is. And so a normal female should have 46 chromosomes and have two X's. A normal male should have 46 chromosomes and an X and a Y. Good stuff. Good stuff. Now, most of us don't do just one test when somebody comes in with a miscarriage. Um, oftentimes there's, there's multiple things we're looking at because we know that, um, in, in people who have a recurrent mm -hmm. pregnancy loss evaluation in our testing, about half of those people are going to have at least one thing wrong. And in those people who have at least one thing wrong, we know that 30% of them may actually have multiple things wrong. So when, when you're doing a recurrent pregnancy loss evaluation, what are, what are some of the other tests that you do? So I think one of the more important ones that we know can cause an issue is our antibodies that are made against the, the blood vessels that go to the baby. So anticardiolopin antibodies or lupus anticoagulant. Those are things that um, essentially can lead to an obstruction and blockage of blood flow to the baby and can result in a miscarriage. And we know from some studies done a long time ago that actually treating a woman with a blood thinner can actually be really helpful in that particular situation. And really that's the only situation that we really know with more certainty that, that that's helpful to be on a blood thinner. Although we use blood thinners in a lot of different situations though as well. So, so I have a lot of patients who come in and they're like, can you just put me on a blood thinner? Why, <laughs> why, is, that a, why is that a big deal? And my heart starts racing when people are like, can I just do it? Blood thinners are not benign medications. I mean, they are life-saving when they are appropriately used, but when they are not appropriately used, all of a sudden that turns to, that turns a random, you slip and you fall down the stairs mm -hmm. or you take a tumble because you weren't quite awake or your leg was asleep when you stepped out of bed and all of a sudden you're, you know, in a puddle on the floor because <laughs> leg was asleep. You know, it takes those little lumps and bumps and makes them a much bigger deal. Yeah. And the thing that everybody really and truly worries about is what if you bonk your head and you're on a blood thinner and all of a sudden a tiny little bleed that would ordinarily clot itself off before it could cause any problems becomes a big bleed and, and all of a sudden you have a big problem. And so we try to really only use those blood thinners when they are clinically indicated because 
there's a risk and a benefit to everything. And if we know that we give it and the benefit is going to be that you get a, you know, get a live birth because you have XYZ chromosomal and abnormality or antibodies or whatever it may be, then absolutely it is worth that risk. But if we're just doing it for the hell of it, then that gives your physicians chest pain. And without a physician, it's a lot harder to get a pregnant in this case. So we're going to try and keep the physician alive too, and not give you unnecessary medications that can cause legit problems. Well, and kind of one corollary to that is I always tell patients if they're on a blood thinner, particularly something like Lovenox or heparin, less people on heparin these days, but Lovenox particularly, if you're on something like that, make a note and put it in your wallet where your driver's license is. So if you're in a car accident, police are always going to look at that. And the EMTs are going to look at that first to see who you are. And also let your family members know, because they may think, oh, she's taking something like aspirin. But like Carrie said, if somebody slips and falls out of bed and hits their head, that could become a really big deal really fast. And so it's just really important to let your partner know or somebody in the house with you that you're on a blood thinner in case you do take a fall and get knocked out or something. Another important thing to understand is when we talk about putting somebody on a blood thinner, like it's so big a deal that we actually keep you on it, not only through your pregnancy, but usually for six weeks postpartum. So it, it, it's not like we're like, oh, we're going to do this just through the first trimester and, and then we're going to take you off of it. Like it, it's one of those kind of, for the most part, it's, that's a like nine, 10 month commitment. And so, you know, it's, that that's a long time that you're going to be doing daily injectable medications. If you're on certain types of blood thinners, um, if you start off on Lovenox, I tend to use Lovenox more than heparin. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you get closer to delivery, you usually have to switch your medications because we can turn heparin off a little bit easier. But if you end up having a rapid labor or certain things happen, you may be limited in the types of anesthesia that you can have during delivery. So it's not, it, it's not always like, Oh, I'm going into labor and I'm going to get my epidural and bum, bum, bum. Um, that, that may not actually be in the cards for you, depending on how, how the course of events happen. So the, these are important things to understand that, that this is, this is a big, I, a lot of times I, I think patients don't really understand why this is such a big deal. Mm -hmm. Um, if you have positive antiphospholipid antibodies, the general course is that we don't just make that decision based on that single blood draw. We actually repeat those in 12 weeks, which we know is really hard for our patients because we know you, we wanted, you wanted to be pregnant, you know, yesterday, ago, <laughs> yesterday. Yeah. And so it it's, it's a big deal to us. It's a big deal. What are, what are some of the kind of endocrine things that we look at that can contribute to pregnancy loss? So we look at diabetes. Um, we're going to check in usually an A1C is the easiest lab to look at. And the A1C is a quantitative measure. So numerical measure of what your average blood sugar has been over the past three months or so. And so we're typically looking for an A1C that's in the five range. Um, and sometimes, you know, 4.8, 4.9, once you start getting above six, we start to worry about well, the sugar regulation is not as tight as it should be. By the time it hits seven, we're, we're worried when it's in the low sixes, we're, we're just paying much closer attention. The problems that we really worry about is when you see an A1C that's eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, that means that there is very poor blood sugar control. And mm -hmm. when you see that poor blood sugar control, you have a much higher rate of anomalies in the baby. So major heart defects being the, the scary one, and you see a much higher rate of miscarriage. And so that's part of the reason why as a standard evaluation, pretty much all of us, when you walk into our office and we're ordering the initial tests, we're going to put an A1C in there because if that's high, we need you to get that under control before we really do any fertility treatment because we don't want to be seeing you for a miscarriage that we could maybe have avoided with tighter control. For a child with a significant fetal anomaly, even worse yep. probably. Yeah, those heart defects are are big Limb bad abnormalities, numbers. all kinds of bad things. Yeah. So what about things like thyroid and prolactin? So yeah, we definitely look at your thyroid and we look at thyroid antibodies. There's a little bit of... Um, not complete agreement in terms of when patients are treated, but typically with your thyroid, with your TSH, we want it to run less than 2.5. So in most labs, normal is about 0.4 to 4, 0.4 to 5, somewhere in that range. 
And so I always have patients that come and go, well, my primary care doctor wondered why you put me on Synthroid because he said my TSH was normal, but there's kind of a different standard that we have and the we being um, reproductive endocrinologist and also the endocrine society has accepted as normals. So anything less than 2.5 is kind of what we shoot for. And if we had to choose, we'd rather have you on even the, you know, rather than being on the higher side of things, we'd rather, if there was an extreme one way or another, we'd rather you be on the lower side of things. So less than 2.5 is what we shoot for. We also look at thyroid antibodies. And generally, if your TSH is under 2.5, it doesn't really change our management of your thyroid. But if you have thyroid antibodies, we kind of keep a closer eye on you because your numbers can bounce up and down a whole lot more. Um, so certainly that's something that we consider when we're doing the workup for recurrent pregnancy loss as well. One thing I wanted to mention for our listeners is when we're talking about thyroid, we're often measuring something called TSH. TSH mm -hmm. is the hormone the brain produces that tells the thyroid what to do. So if your TSH level is high, meaning your brain's having to work a lot to get your thyroid what to do, that means your thyroid actually is a little underactive. So high TSH means actually low thyroid hormone. Good point, so, yeah. So we're wanting to add in thyroid hormone so that your TSH level drops. And so sometimes people get a little on that hypo hyperthyroidism. So high TSH is actually hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's how that correlates. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's a little hormone secreted by the brain that normally called prolactin that normally makes you get breast milk after you have babies. But if that's off, that can increase your risk of miscarriages as well. Um, something I had actually in the last couple of weeks, I, I I've had a couple of people who come in they're ladies who essentially are like, I need you to evaluate only me because I have recurrent pregnancy loss. Is that, <laughs> is that a good idea or, or is this one of those fertility is a team sport things? Uh, fertility is always a team sport. <laughs> Takes two always to tango, baby. You cannot yeah. do this by yourself. Well, and what Carrie mentioned earlier about a tra balanced translocation, that's one of the key things I think that men can be equally part of as far as women. So balanced translocations where a piece of one chromosome um, has switched places with a piece of another chromosome, it's present in most or all of the cells of that person and certainly in the, the gonads, either the, the ovaries or the testes. And so women can, women or men almost equally, I mean, equally can have this balanced translocation and they may have the right amount of chromosomal material, but it, like Carrie said earlier, when either a woman goes to make eggs, if she has a balanced translocation or if a man goes to make sperm and he has a balanced translocation, probably at least two thirds of the eggs or the sperm are, are, are balanced. So some people would argue that even though a karyotype may be the most expensive test to do, that if you do a karyotype and you find that somebody has a balanced translocation, you found the answer right there without doing any other test. And just because you've had a child before, either in this relationship or a prior relationship does not mean that you're off the hook for the evaluation. That is absolutely true. I've had several patients that have gotten lucky in the genetic lottery the first time around, had a healthy baby. And then the second time they just keep having miscarriage after miscarriage. And we find that one of the partners carry a balanced translocation. Let's talk a little bit about the timing of some of these tests, because when people have a miscarriage, they're, they're wanting to have the conversation in the room when the miscarriage is diagnosed about what caused this, why, and what testing can we do immediately. And some of that we can do right away and some of it we cannot. So the thing that if you are, if you're in the room with us, if we can get a genetic evaluation on what are called the products of conception. And so the, the actual pregnancy material, if we can get that, we, we appreciate that. Now it's important to know that that testing is not a hundred percent. And what I mean by that is sometimes you can, um, sometimes if the pregnancy has been gone for a little while, you mm -hmm. don't get any cells to grow. And so you don't get an answer. Sometimes the cells that are picked up are mom's cells. Mm -hmm. And so you don't get an answer. And so it is not a, a foolproof evaluation, but when you see something that's abnormal, it can give people a lot of peace of mind of this is why this happened. Because one of the mm -hmm. really brutal things about miscarriages is people go, well, why did this happen? And 50% of the time we're going to say, we don't know. And most people would much rather say that, uh, much rather know that they, you know, have X, Y, Z, horrible, awful, terrible problem, because at least they know it's the uncertainty that is really brutal in much of what we do. 
Well, and I think genetic testing, as you pointed out, when somebody has a miscarriage, is really, really helpful because if somebody, a lot of times I'll have patients that'll say, well, my OBGYN didn't do it because this was just my first or, or just my second miscarriage or whatever. But, you know, if you knew that both of those only, you know, she only had two pregnancies and you knew if both of them were genetically abnormal, that would certainly make you go, hmm, you know, you, I mean, that's your reason right there. And it may lead you to kind of what you want to do in terms of treatment for that particular patient. So, as opposed to like blood thinners, for example. So back to our, our listeners question is that if you've had two losses, I think all three of us unanimously would say you need to have an evaluation. And, and if your doctor's not willing to do it, then I would, I would look for a doctor mm -hmm. to do the evaluation. Now, there are certain tests that you can't do when you are immediately like in the midst of a miscarriage. Yes. So those anticardiolipin antibodies, that whole set of testing, you have to wait until the pregnancy clears because if prolactin you do them- Prolactin and too, thyroid too. Prolactin and thyroid too, because if you do them while you still have that HCG floating around, your body physiology has not returned to normal yet. And you're going to get abnormal answers that are not true. And so as much as it is painful for us to say- look, I'm sorry, you have to wait. The reason we're doing it is because we want answers that are true to you, not um, not abnormal because of just how your physiology is working right now. Well, one other thing we didn't mention either was a uterine evaluation. You definitely can't do that while somebody's pregnant. And, yeah. and a lot of times we want to look at the shape of your cavity because sometimes that can impact miscarriage. If you have a septum, which is a partial division down the uterine cavity, if you have two separate uteruses, that can make a difference. Any type of uterine abnormality or malformation in the uterus, some you can be born with, um, some you can acquire, like a fibroid, which is a benign growth or commonly a benign growth that presses into the cavity. That can have a negative impact on pregnancy. Scar tissue in your cavity can have a negative impact. So Polyps. those are definitely things that you would want to look at as well in, in a mm -hmm. workup. Endometritis too. Mm -hmm. Are the fallopian tubes important? They are <laughs> always. So one of the things that we pay attention to when someone comes to me and they've had a lot of biochemical pregnancies, meaning nothing ever was seen in the uterus. And the thing that I always worry about is, mm -hmm. did it actually make it to the uterus or are these ectopic right. pregnancies that resolved fast enough that they didn't cause major bleeding or and require methotrexate or surgery? But that's the underlying reason why someone's having miscarriages is because they're getting stuck in the tubes and they haven't made it down to the uterus. And so they can't safely implant and grow. And the body is thankfully recognized it too early. And so I always order the tub tubal evaluation because if there is a big hydrosalpinx, so fluid filled tube, I want to know about it because that indicates tubal damage. And when you have a big hydrosalpinx, the classical thinking is that the fluid in there is going to decrease subsequent successful IVF cycles. And we extrapolate that to regular pregnancies as well. And so if you have one totally normal tube and one hydro, oftentimes we'll recommend like, let's get rid of the hydro, let's do surgery. And, and the reason it. is, is that fluid is not only, not only is it in the tube, but it can actually go back into the uterus and it's embryo toxic. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> now I've got a good one. I have patients all the time that are like, how can I be having a miscarriage? My HCG level is still positive. Mm. Good question. Well, the placenta is really where the HCG comes from. It doesn't necessarily mean if you have an elevated HCG that the baby is continuing to grow. So the baby may never develop. And you like, with, for example, the blotted ovum that Susan, the term that Susan doesn't like, a lot of times I'll see patients that they're, they're blotted ovum. If you wait a week or two, sometimes it will continue to grow. The placenta will continue to grow. You know, it's really kind of a kick in the butt, frankly, because people feel pregnant. They feel more and more pregnant. Their breasts are tender as that tissue grows, but yet there's no baby in there or there, or the baby has passed and we can't see it. And so, um, so the placenta is where the HCG comes from. And that's why it can continue to grow up, even if it's not a normal pregnancy. Very good. Very good. Um, let's obviously most of our conversation today has been the diagnosis part of once you have recurrent pregnancy loss. 
Um, let's just talk a little bit about what are some potential treatments. I know that's almost a completely another episode, but just so that we have a few pointers um, for people listening to this one, and we can do another episode on treatments of recurrent pregnancy loss. One thing I want to say before we move on to that though, is what I always tell patients right at the end of, you know, when we talk about all these things that we can do, and there's lots of different things we can look at. The problem with with the recurrent pregnancy loss workup is there's so many things we don't know. There's so many things that have to happen for an egg and a sperm to go together. We don't, we don't have tests for those things. And we don't really know, is it the embryos issue? Is it the uterus's issue? What about the implantation factors in the uterus, which we know are present, but we don't really have tests for. So we do our best as physicians to try and figure out what's going on. But, you know, it may be that we, as Susan mentioned earlier on, we may do all this and we may still not know what the reason is, um, but it doesn't mean we're not, not going to still try and help you get pregnant and still try and do things to, to move forward. Right. Right. So one nice thing that I like patients to understand about recurrent pregnancy loss is, is that there are very good studies that show that if you decided to not do treatment, meaning doing something aggressively, not necessarily like let's fix your thyroid or let's fix your prolactin, but doing fertility type treatments that most people are eventually going to be able to be successful. Our problem is we can't tell you if that's going to be pregnancy number three or pregnancy mm -hmm. number nine. And so a lot of your decision-making when it comes to what do we as a couple or individual plan to do next for, you know, this next pregnancy, it's a, it's a, where your mind and your heart come together because none of us can, can tell if you're going to be that person who has the very strong emotional fortitude to be able to make it to that pregnancy mm -hmm. down yeah. the road, because that's really a, what it takes a lot yeah. of, a lot of people don't, and that is okay. That is why we're here, but we want to make sure, you know, that there is a variety of things to mm -hmm. do. And the, the best thing is going to be the re best thing for the two of you. So the, the least invasive option is, as Susan was talking about, what's called expectant management. We just let you go and we see what happens. And usually with that type of management, there is a bit more handholding involved. Like as soon as you get a positive pregnancy test, we're going to bring you in and check numbers. Tell us. And then we're going to check them again and then again. And then as soon as we expect to see a baby in the uterus, we're going to order an ultrasound. Even if we know we're just going to see the sac. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot more connection. And usually with an REI, you're getting more intensive following than you would with a regular OBGYN, because that's what, that's what we are built for. The regular OBGYNs are not built for that. And nor they're really built to see you at eight weeks. They're built to see you at, you know, usually eight to 10 weeks and that's what they're set for. And so we see you back a lot more frequently. Now, oftentimes when you get that positive pregnancy test, we are going to empirically, meaning without data, but we think it's going to help anyway, start you on progesterone and <laughs> makes um, us feel good and probably you too. Yeah. And that's, that's really arguably the best that it does. Um, yeah. same with the baby aspirin, you know, the data is not really there, but it makes everybody feel better. And it's a much weaker much. blood thinner, yeah. um, than something like Lovenox or heparin. And so it's the, okay, you're not, you're not going to be hurt by this. So let's give it a shot. Now people always ask, well, should I just start that beforehand? And the answer is no, because aspirin is an NSAID. It can potentially inhibit ovulation. <laughs> prevent you from getting pregnant and progesterone while wildly helpful for supporting a pregnancy if it's used differently it is birth control and so we tend to be really um much more adamant about hey let's wait until you get that positive pregnancy test and as soon as you do we'll start you on those things depending on how your your particular rei or ob views it there's some that won't do that but um, but I know many of us will, um, because it makes you feel better and frankly treats your physician as well. And more importantly, there's a study, a lot, an old study that looked at TLC, tender loving care, which is what Carrie was just describing. Yes. To try and comfort you. Bring it helps. You in. It, it helps. helps. Make it better outcomes. 
nobody's really, I mean, the studies show that people that had tender loving care versus people who did not, by their definition, I can't remember exactly what their definition was, did better and had better outcomes. And, More you know, I don't think, monitoring. Any, I don't think anybody has looked at the physiology of that. But, you know, I know when I feel like I'm being babied and watched after and taken care of, probably my cortisol levels are lower. My epinephrine levels are probably lower. And probably there's some physiologic basis to that. You know, it makes sense. I think if you're being kind of coddled a little bit, it kind of helps. You're less likely to land in jail for murdering your spouse. <laughs> Always Probably good. Thing. True. Probably true. Always good. Always good. So beyond that, we can do things to help you get pregnant faster. Usually some form of super ovulation with inseminations or things like that. And then we have things like IVF. IVF has the very nice benefit in that we can test the embryos. So we know if they're chromosomally normal or not. And thereby taking out some of, some of that guesswork of are, are, is the, is the embryo that's in my uterus got the best chance. And if we know it's chromosomally normal, we know it's got a better chance than that 50, 50 dice that you're rolling when you're achieving pregnancy short of IVF. Yeah. And it, it takes out, I always tell my patients, in fact, I was just talking to a couple yesterday about this. I'm like, you know, there's no guarantee even with IVF that the pregnancy will continue on, but if you look on average, about 50% of pregnancies are genetically abnormal. We're taking that 50% out of the mix. So automatically we're giving you a better chance. And in my experience, I've had a lot of success with people that have recurrent pregnancy loss going on to have a healthy pregnancy afterwards. And, and this is, this is my observation. I, I would love to have your um, ideas about this, but in, in my experience, when I do IVF, in patients with recurrent pregnancy loss, I don't tend to see more chromosomally abnormal embryos. Once in a while I do, but most of the time they're, they're what I would expect based on age. And so what it appears to me is that there are certain women that abnormal embryos either implant or implant and stick longer than they do the average woman. And, and I think that's, that's a huge proportion of our patients with recurrent pregnancy loss. For a lot of people who are making the decision of, well, do I just keep trying on my own or do I do more, more involved fertility treatment? A lot of times what I'll tell people is think about the worst possible option. Think about, okay, let's say you try on your own and you have either no pregnancies or two or three more um, miscarriages and think about, think about the worst case scenario and, and think about, would I still feel that that was an appropriate decision or would I have major regrets if I get to the end of that? And so it's one of the things that when people are, are agonizing about, do we do this expensive treatment or do we not? Um, that can kind of help you sort it out. And also what's your emotional state right now? Because many people, everybody thinks that people stop fertility treatment because of the financial. And yeah, that's a part of it. But there are many, many people who stop because of the emotional. Many more stop because of the emotional. Many more stop. Yeah, I would say so, yeah. Because they're like, I am out. I am done. I do not want to do this anymore. I cannot do this anymore. And, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a gazillionaire. You're just like, emotionally, I am tapped. And, yeah. and some of it has to do with your timeline. You know, if you're older, if you're in your upper 30s or 40s, your, your timeline of what can you expend just trying on your own is theoretically shorter. And also depending on how many children you're ideally wanting to have, you know, if you come to us and you're 25 and you've had a couple of miscarriages, you, you've still got a good amount of reproductive life in, 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 in the time zone after we make sure your ovaries are working fine. Um, cause occasionally people with diminished ovarian reserve do have, um, recurrent pregnancy loss, um, just because they're, they're poor quality eggs. But if you come in and you're, you know, 35 and you still want to have three children and you're, you've had a couple of miscarriages that that's a different timeline to be considering. So, you know, don't, don't get lulled into the <laughs> fake allure that our media has given people that just because you look young, that your ovaries are young because well, that, chronological that age is very real. One well, the other point with that too, Susan, is we all know as women get older, they're just more likely to miscarry because they have more chromosomally abnormal embryos. So if you're 40, you know, chances are about 40% that you're going to miscarry, even if you get pregnant. And that's just a function of age. And it's just a function of the fact that at 40, about 90% of your eggs are genetically abnormal. So, all yeah. right. Well, I think we've, we've talked a lot 
go talk to your doctor. Do not do this by yourself. You know, there's lots of us out there to help you. And get emotional support too. I think this going through miscarriage after miscarriage or miscarriage for most people is really draining. So get emotional support too from a psychologist Mm -hmm. or or minister or something mm-hmm. it's hard and and other people who've gone through miscarriages because yep. it's a it's kind of an isolating thing and that's unfortunate because it is an experience that so many people have had right. that there's no re there's no reason for you to go through it alone because so many other people have been through it with you yeah and remember one in seven pregnancies results in miscarriage so there's there's that's a lot that's a lot so Okay, to our audience, thank you so much for listening today and be sure to tune in next week for more. Also be sure to subscribe and leave us a review in Apple Podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So make sure to follow and subscribe to stay updated on all things infertility. You can also visit fertilitydocsuncensored.com to submit specific questions that you have about infertility. All questions will be answered on the podcast anonymously in our Ask the Doc segment, so don't hold back. We also love episode ideas, so let us know what you want to hear about. And as always, this podcast is intended for entertainment. It's not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.